From Canada's mass surveillance program to massive human rights abuses by the Canadian government, as well as clandestine operations by the RCMP and terrorist attacks of Canada, welcome to the dark history of Canada. Project Wide Awake. In a leaked file by Edward Snowden, he revealed a very interesting fact about Canada's own national security agency, and that they have access to a device called Warrior Pride. Warrior Pride is known for many things. It has a code name based on the Smurfs, and each of these Smurfs can do a different thing to your phone. The first thing is the Dreamy Smurf, and you can open your phone remotely without you even knowing. The second is the Nosy Smurf. You can open your microphone and listen to you through your phone without you even knowing that they're listening to your conversations. So, you know, if you're you know, talking badly about people, you know, maybe they already have the file. Next one is the Tracker Smurf. And the Tracker Smurf is pretty self-implicit. It tracks your location. Uh, it also tracks your phone web history. So if you guys like to watch uh, Incognito uh, stuff, well, uh, the incognito mode doesn't really hide your IP, so they kind of know what you're doing uh, and your photos, your emails have all been uh, probably seen or stocked into a database by the CSE. Uh, well, this was heavily used against Muslim targets, uh, especially looking at the porn they watch and revealing it to them. So, don't watch freaky stuff on forbidden websites. Operation Vampire. In 1970, Quebec was in its independence crisis. There were terrorists kidnapping politicians. Um, they were putting bombs in mailboxes. Um, all of that to make Quebec independent. The aftermath of this is clandestine operations by the ARCMP that would investigate Quebec citizens uh, to try to find more of these extremists or slash uh, radical separatists. They did 1,000 clandestine break-ins as well as 497 searches without warrant. And this operation was part of a bigger operation called Operation Bricole. This included Operation Vampire, which they placed microphone in, in offices to try to find you know, these Quebec separatists, of course without consent, as well as Operation Kuma, uh, which was about uh, breaking into uh, buildings and taking pictures of their documents without them knowing, of course without warrant. As well as Operation Ham, which is a theft of the list of the Parti Québécois. The Parti Québécois is a political party that, uh, well, at that time really wanted uh, the independence of Quebec. But they were no, they were not, you know, radical terrorists. They were just a political party who believed in uh, the, the independence of Quebec. Sunshine Valley. You'll come to see that this is not really about sunshine or you know it's not something like Riverdale you know riding horses it's much darker than that to understand Sunshine Valley uh, and what happened there we have to go back to 1941 in 1941 the Japanese Imperial forces attacked Pearl Harbor this began uh, a massive internment campaign and war campaign against the Japanese and those affected by it were also Canadians, and Canadians who were of Japanese descent. Now, a huge majority of these Japanese were actually Canadian. They were born here, they have been raised there all their lives, but under this new uh, order, their bank assets were froze, uh, they lost everything they had, their houses, their boats, all of this were taken away from them, and they were sent to internment camps. One of these internment camps is Sunshine Valley. Sunshine Valley at, at that time was a ghost town and they bought it, it was you know, a farm and they basically you know, built a clandestine camp uh, over there. And they had roadblocks so no one could really go in and no one could really go out. And the barracks they built was, you know, it wasn't a you know, high quality built, you know. It, it's very rushed and especially, you know, all you Canadians know how cold it can be in Canada. And even in our normal houses, it can get whole cold. Imagine in these small cabins that are, um, well, it was extremely cold in these 
uh, in these camps and they had to you know make way find ways to you know uh, feel a bit warmer um, and this was not the only internment camps there was lots of internment camps all across Canada uh, the common concerns was uh, the floors were swarming with maggots uh, the food was cold was bland was was not good um, the toilets in some camps was you know just a small hole that was dug and you know everyone just did their deed there and it smelled awful Vancouver 5 in the 1980s a group of urban terrorists emerged in Vancouver they believed that traditional methods of protest against the government was inefficient petitions protests um, etc and they resorted to acts of terrorism all across the country some may see them as heroes some may see them as uh, criminals and I'll, I'll, I'll leave you to judge what would you qualify them as they first began bombing the BC hydro station from what I understand why they bombed the hydro station is because when you build a hydroelectric plant it blocks the river flow and when you block it well it causes floods and with floods it destroys uh, animal habitats the natural environment and towns villages uh, that are close to uh, the river uh, the second place they'll bomb is Lytton Industries in Toronto and they were a pretty controversial company because they were manufacturing missiles for the United States of America and there were a lot of concerns of whether uh, these missiles could be nuclear and you could uh, you know, have nuclear missiles uh, hanging around and bombing a lot of more countries uh, creating a lot more victims the next target was Red Hot Video. Red Hot Video sold pornographic content uh, that had a lot of violence towards women as well as content. And this company was also very controversial and had attracted a lot of attention for the, for, for this you know uh, for selling these kinds of big content. And what they would do is they would uh, firebomb many of these locations across the country. The Vancouver Five would eventually be arrested and sentenced to jail. The horrors of Kamloop. Kamloop was one of the many, many residential schools in Canada. And you know, before it was, this was not, you know, like I think most of people now know about the residential school system, but before it was really a known history. No one really knew about what happened. Uh, and today I'm gonna give you details about these places. Uh, Details that has gotten me in trouble on TikTok, but I think I can say it over here if I censored some things uh, in India. I, I, one of the tragic, most tragic testimonies I have read about this uh, is, is the testimony of a young girl, and she said, He removed me of my clothes. I cried. I screamed. I screamed of pain. I begged him to not use the salt, but he continued to use the salt on my wounds. The residential school system was created by John A. MacDonald, and in his speech himself, he said that the goal of the uh, residential school system was to take the indigenous children as much as possible. The ideology behind the residential school system was to remove the Indian from the child. That means that they wanted to remove their identity and kind of like brainwash them into not being indigenous. Uh, and often the kids would be tortured into not doing behavior that are proper to the indigenous peoples of Canada. Uh, for example, they would remove all of their hair. For the indigenous, for the indigenous people, the, the hair is very, very important, but it removed their sense of identity. The children were crying, but you know, when they cut their hair, they didn't care. One way that they would make sure that these uh, children would not do anything indigenous was speaking their own language. If they spoke their own language, they would be rubbed with the thing on their tongue repeatedly every time they spoke their own tongue. These indigenous children were traumatized for life and many tried to run away. They really tried. Uh, when they tried, they would either freeze to death, they would be eaten by animals, uh, and or they were caught back by the RCMP. When they would be brought back to the schools, uh, they were beaten in front of everyone uh, the genitals would be repeatedly kicked by an adult, you know, a 12-year-old kid being kicked 
by an adult in front of everyone, beaten, humiliated. Uh, children would be locked in these locker rooms alone, uh, often with little to no food uh, and little to no water as well. No child. Uh, of course, very insanitary. And one inspector who visited the residential schools remarked that this was not a normal school. The children seemed to lack any emotions. They were dead inside almost. And the survivors of the indigenous schools had to struggle with lifetime PTSD, depression. Uh, many of them went to drug abuse to forget the horrors of the residential school system that will forever taint the history of Canada. Baby scoop. When, when, when I read about this, it was extremely devastating. And even one of my followers have one of these stories, one of these testimonies from their mother that I'm going to share uh, in this video, of course. But first of all, what is the baby scoop? The baby scoop was in the 1960s. The Canadian government took indigenous children and basically adopted them into white families. And this was on a basis of race uh, and even poverty. Um, there was no approval from the parent. They never agreed that they wanted to give their, their, their children to a white family. Uh, they never agreed that they wanted their children into an orphanage. And these children were not orphans. They, these children had parents, that, but they were just taken away from their parents. Uh, it was often done with the use of a social worker who was often didn't have any training and was just told, oh, you have to put these people uh, into orphanages. So it kind of went into this, this welfare system, but it was extremely harmful to the indigenous communities who lost their children, who lost their babies. Uh, and one of my uh, followers, and that I'll put over here, uh, she said that her mother was also taken away uh, from her family, but thankfully uh, her grandmother had adopted her. But if she was not adopted by her own grandmother, she would have been put into a family that she didn't know. Uh, and her parents, of course, would have been extremely devastated. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Dark History and I'll see you in the next video. This episode wouldn't have been possible without my Kofi supporters Al Mihai, Agrabin, Luke, Sarah Palacios, Java City Coffee, Riley, Dilly, Elk, Lolol XL2, Tyler, Kyle, Alicia, and Kyle EXC, Audrey, and Oliver. If you also want to support, you can head over to my description and press on the Kofi link down below.